Hey guys, I'm back at it with Maniac McGee. We are reading chapters 33 through 37. So listen up. January of that year was too cold and dry for snow. It was a month of frozen hardness of ice. Maniac drifted from hour to hour, day to day, alone in his memories, a stunned and solitary wanderer. He ate only to keep from starving, warmed his body only enough to keep it from freezing to death, ran only because there was no reason to stop. Even if the superintendent had allowed it, he could not have brought himself to stay at the band shell. He returned only long enough to pick up a few things, a blanket, some non-perishable food, the glove, and as many books as he could squeeze into the old black satchel that hauled Grayson's belongings around the minor leagues. Before he left for good, he got some paint and angrily brushed over the 101 on the door. During the days, he ran, usually a slow jog, but sometimes he would suddenly sprint, furious 10 or 20 second bursts, as though trying to leave himself behind. Sometimes he walked, he crossed and recrossed the river, he wandered in all directions through all surrounding communities and townships, Bridgeport, Conschlocken, East Norriton, West Norriton, Jeffersonville, Plymouth, Worcester. Whenever he crossed the bridge over the school, he turned his eyes so as not to see the nearby P&W trestle. Even so, in his mind's eye, he saw the red and yellow trolley careening from the high track, plunging to the water, killing his parents over and over. After a while, he stopped crossing the bridge. Other than that, he went wherever there was room to go forward, along roads and alleys and railroad tracks, across fields and cemeteries and golf courses. From high above, a tra a tracing of his routes would have looked as hopelessly tangled as cobble's knot. By nightfall, he was back in two mills. He would retrieve his satchel from wherever he had stashed it and find a place to endure the night. A few times he revisited the buffalo pen where he covered himself with a blanket of straw. Other times, his overnight quarters might have been an abandoned car, an empty garage, a basement stairwell. When his original supply of food ran out, he fed himself at the zoo or at the soup kitchen down at the Salvation Army. He did odd jobs for housewives, ran errands for shopkeepers. He would not beg. One day, he found himself among monuments and cannon in Roland Hills. He was in Valley Forge. Here, the Continental Army had suffered through a winter of their own, and the vast, stark, frozen desolation itself seemed more, pro more seemed a more proper monument than statues and stones. The only buildings here were tiny log and mortar cabins, replicas of Army shelters. Maniac could feel the ache swelling outward from his breast and fill in the enormous, bounding spaces. He returned to town for the satchel and put himself up in one of the cabins. It was scarcely bigger than a large doghouse. The floor was dirt. There was a doorway, but no door. Several saltines fell from the blanket. He threw them outside, let the birds have them. He wrapped himself in the blanket and lay down. He lay there all night and all the next day. Dreams pursued memories, uh, courted and danced and coupled with them, and they became one and the gaunt, beseeching phantoms that called to him had the, ra had the rag wrapped feet of Washington's regulars and the faces of his mother and father and Aunt Dot and Uncle Dan and the Bills and Earl Grayson. In that bedeviled army, there would be no more recruits. No one else would orphan him. The second evening came and went. Maniac never stirred, knowing it would be, it would not be fast or easy or no, sorry, knowing it would not be fast or easy and wanting, deserving nothing less, grimly, patiently, he waited for death. Chapter 34. It was during the second night in the cabin that he heard the little voices. They were not soldiers, voices. I'm going in this one. No, that one. That one's bigger. I'm tired. I'm stopping. You stupid meatball. It's right there. Another two seconds. I'm staying. Great. You beef jerky. Stay. I'm going to that one. Good night. Silence. And then, hold on. I'm coming. That was all. The ghostly soldiers returned, their haunted eyes seeking warmth, food, life. There was no morning, only daylight in the doorway. He pushed himself up, dragged himself outside into the blinding light. The saltines lay in the brown frozen grass. The next, ca the next cabin was nearby. 
January slipped an icy finger under his collar and down his back. He pulled the blanket tighter about himself, but it was too late. The finger had touched the last warm coal in his hearth and his body, fanning the ember, shook itself violently. He walked to the next cabin, looked inside, saw a body huddled in the corner. An eye opened, stared at him. Then in succession, three more eyes opened. The body divided and became two, two little boys. Get a load of this meatball, said one with a front missing tooth. He walks around with a blanket on. Hey, meatball, why didn't you bring your mattress along too? And your pillows too, screeched the other. Then missing tooth whipped off his woolen cap and smacked Screecher in the face. Screecher retaliated and a maniac had to step back while a two-kid tornado swirled around the cabin. When they finished, they rolled onto their backs, shook their legs at the ceiling, and laughed as long as they had fought. The volume coming from Screecher was incredible, as though a microphone were embedded in his throat. Finally, Missing Tooth rediscovered the stranger standing in the doorway. Hey, Meatball, you running away too? No, not really, Maniac replied. Well, we are, went Screecher. Where are you going, Maniac asked. The answer came from both Mexico. Maniac bit back a grin. When they stood, he saw they couldn't have been more than four feet tall or eight years old. Well, he said, it's good and warm down there, but it's pretty far, you know. Yeah, we know, growled Missing Tooth. You think we're meatballs like you? He grabbed a supermarket bag from the corner, opened it. Look, it was filled with candy, cupcakes, pies, even a pack of butterscotch crumpets. Maniac's stomach rasped against itself. He remembered how thirsty he was. Where'd you get all this? We stole it, Screecher blurted. The other smacked him with his cap. Shut up, Piper, you stupid sausage. Don't you go telling people you stole stuff. Piper returned the cap slap. You shut up, Russell. And I didn't tell him where we stole it. This time the fight was over in less than a minute, but it started up again when Maniac asked where they were from and Piper said two mills and Russell said, shut up, he might be a cop and bopped him good. When they settled down, they stared at him warily. Piper snickered, he ain't no cop, he's a kid. Yeah, sneered Russell, that's how much you know? They got cops that look like kids. That's how they catch kids. They stared at him some more. They moved in cautiously, one on either side. They opened his blanket. They patted him all over. What are you doing this for? Piper wanted to know. We're feeling for a gun, Russell explained. Oh. After patting, they backed off. So, said Russell, you ain't a cop? Not me, said Maniac. He moved in from the doorway. I'm... And only a moment's pause, the story came to him. A pizza delivery boy. We have a contest every week, and you two were chosen for a free pizza. The two gaped at each other. We were? Yep, a large. Where is it? demanded Russell, glancing around. At Cobble's Corner. You have 24 hours to claim your prize. He waited while they bickered over what to do. Valley Forge was a good five or six miles from two mills. These kids might not have made it to Mexico, but they had come a long way and stayed overnight stayed out overnight, and someone somewhere must be worried sick about them. And he had the feeling they weren't kidding about stealing the food. He figured he better help them make up their minds. You know, he said, you're taking the long way to Mexico. If you come back to two mills with me, I'll show you a shortcut. That did it. Soon the three of them were trekking past Washington Memorial Chapel, Russell and Piper with their bag, Maniac with his satchel. It was early afternoon when they walked into Cobble's Corner at Hector and Birch. Maniac produced his certificate for conquering Cobble's Knot, and 20 minutes later, the young runaways were attacking a large pizza with pepperoni. Maniac confined himself to three glasses of water and half a dozen crimpets. The boys agreed with Maniac that they ought to stay the night in their own house before setting out for Mexico in the morning. They were barely a block from Cobble's when Maniac heard a familiar voice bellowing and barreling down the street was a fearsome fast baller, the king of cobras, Big John McNabb himself, and he was roaring mad. Maniac might have taken off, but he found himself chugging, I'm sorry, found himself clung to and clutched by the two little urchins. They huddled behind him like babies on the possum's back as Giant John came red-faced and huffing up to them. Where you been? he yelled. As Maniac considered what to say, the urchins peeped from behind him. We was in no place, John. We was right here with this here kid, and he ain't no cop neither. We checked him out. For the first time, Giant John looked straight at Maniac. A smile crossed his face. Well, well, the frog man. The smile vanished. So what are you doing with my little brothers? Chapter 35.
It took a while for everything to get straightened out. First, Giant John had to be convinced that Maniac was not kidnapping his brothers. Then the brothers had to do some more trembling and clinging while John finished lambasting them for running away, which apparently they did about every other week. Then, when the brothers found out that their pizza person was none other than the famous Maniac McGee, the very same one who had blasted their big brother's fastballs to smithereens and finished him off with a home run frog, well, it took a good five minutes of rolling on the sidewalk to get all the laughing out of their systems, which of course got Giant John more than a little steamed. Prompting Maniac, who didn't like seeing John disgrace before his little brothers to say, yeah, but didn't John tell you what happened the next day? And the little brothers said, no, what? And Giant said, Giant John said, huh? And Maniac winked at John and crossed his fingers. Sure, John, you remember, wink, wink, at the little league field the next day. You said I was lucky that all you threw me was fastballs because you weren't ready to reveal your secret pitch, the one you've been working on, remember? McNabb nodded dumbly. And so I said, well, come on, I can hit anything. Pitch it to me. And you pitched it and I missed it by a mile. And you kept pitching it to me all day long. And I never hit a foul ball. I never even hit a foul ball on it. Was that the pitch? Was that the pitch? Chanted the urchins. It was. Maniac paused for dramatic buildup. The stop ball. The stop ball. Yeah, you should have seen it. It comes right up to the plate, looking all fat and easy to belt. And then just when you take your swing, Maniac got into his batter stance and demonstrated. It sort of stops and your bat just whiffs the air. He whiffed at an imaginary stop ball. Wow, said the brothers, gazing up at their big brother. And so Maniac was invited to accompany the brothers McNabb to their home. Despite the cold, the front door was wide open and Maniac could smell the inside before he could see it. The first thing he did see was a yellow, short hair mongrel looking innocently up at him while taking a leak in the middle of the living room floor. Clean that up, John ordered Russell. Clean that up, Russell ordered Piper. Piper just walked on by. After closing the front door, which was surprisingly heavy, Maniac found a stack of newspapers in a corner. He laid some over the puddle to soak in, then gave himself a tour of the downstairs. Maniac had seen some amazing things in his lifetime, but nothing as amazing as that house. From the smell of it, he knew this wasn't the first time an animal had relieved itself on the reckless floor. In fact, in another corner, he spotted a form of relief that could not be soaked up by newspapers. Cans and bottles lay all over, along with crusts, peelings, cores, scraps, rinds, wrappers, everything you would normally find in a garbage can, and everywhere there were raisins. As he walked through the dining room, something, an old tennis ball, hit him on top of the head and bounced away. He looked up into the laughing faces of Russell and Piper. The hole in the ceiling was so big they could have jumped through it at once. He ran a hand along one wall, the peeling paint coming off like cornflakes. Nothing could be worse than living in dining room than the living and dining rooms, yet the kitchen was. A jar of peanut butter had crashed to the floor. Someone had gotten a running start, jumped into it, and skied a brown one footed track to the stove. On the table there were what appeared to be remains of an autopsy performed on a large bird, possibly a crow. The refrigerator contained two food groups, mustard and beer. The raisins were even more abundant. He spotted several of them moving. They weren't raisins. They were roaches. The front door opened, and seconds later, a man clomped into the kitchen. He wore no winter jacket, only a sleeveless green sweatshirt, which ballooned over his enormous stomach. Tattoos blued his upper arms. His hands were nearly pure black. Stale body odor mingled with that of fries and burgers coming from the Burger King bag he held. Dropping the bag next to the bird remains, he bellowed, Chow! and took a beer from the fridge. He downed a good half of it in one swig, belched, double-clutched, and belched again. He had to know someone besides himself was standing in the kitchen, and just as obviously, he didn't care. Two floor-quaking crashes came from the dining room. Geronimo! Geronimo! Russell and Piper had taken the direct route via the hole. What did you bring, Dad? Whoppers? Yeah, whoppers. They tore into the bag like jackals into, into carrion. Plastic flew, fries flew. They both wanted the same whopper. Mashed between their tugging fists, the whoppers splurted sauce and cheese and pickle chips. 
then it split. Russell lurched backward into the kitchen table with his half. Piper lurched backward into the opposite direction and with nothing to stop them, sailed right through the cellar doorway and down the cellar steps. The final thud was followed by a truck horn blast of Piper's laughter. When Giant John ambled in, the father said, get the blocks. No, grunted John, pulling out a pair of whoppers. He tossed one to Maniac. We need more, growled the father. John didn't answer. We need more. I heard. McNabb smashed the tabletop fries and bird wing. Fries and a bird wing jumped to the floor. Now! John walked out nonchalantly munching. I was busy. The rest of the night was scenes from a loony movie. Scene. McNabb, the father, swaggers bare-armed at the front door, bellowing back, Do your own work! Scene. Maniac retrieves the wet newspaper from the living room. There are no waste baskets in the house. He finds a trash can in the backyard next to the pile of cinder blocks. He dumps the soggy papers in a can, which is empty. Scene. Small turds from an unfamiliar shape appear here and there along the baseboards of the first floor. Please don't be rats, Maniac prays. Scene. The cobras come in. They glare at Maniac, but Giant John tells them to lay off. They raid the fridge for beer. They smoke cigarettes. They belch and fart. They curse. Russell and Piper, kitty cobras, pop their own beer cans, guzzle, swagger, belch, smoke, curse. Scene. Football game. From the front of the living room to the back of the dining room, except for space, it has everything a regular game has. Running, passing, blocking, tackling, kicking. There's little furniture to get in the way. Ordinarily, the windows wouldn't last five minutes, but the windows of this house are boarded up with plywood. Body blotched cobras fly into the walls. The house flinches. Scene. A faint rustling noise behind the stove. Oh, no. Rats. Maniac dares uh, to look. It's a turtle. Box turtle. Munching on old wrapper, uh, old whopper lettuce. Whew. Scene. The boy's bedroom. Russell and Piper lie prone to the ho- prone at the hole. They fire toy submachine guns ta, 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 at the cobras heading out the front door. Piper jumps up and blows Maniac away, killing him at least 15 times. This is how we're going to do it. Bam, bam, bam. The guns will be real, says Russell, still prone and firing the stock of the toy gun tight against his cheek. Yeah, squawks Piper, real. He flops back to the floor, sprays the hole downstairs. Soon as they start coming in, bam, bam, bam. Who, says Maniac. The enemy, says Russell. Who's that, says Maniac. Russell stops firing long enough to send Maniac a where have you been look. Who do you think, he sneers. He points the red barrel of the submachine gun toward the bedroom, toward the east, the east end. The heavy front door, scene. Darkness, silence. Sometime early morning, Maniac lies between the two brothers on the bed. The cockroaches climb bedpost, unable to sleep, asking himself, what am I doing here? Remembering Hester and Lester on his lap, Grayson's hug, corn muffin in the toaster oven, thinking, who's the orphan here anyway? Hearing, as he at last lowers himself into sleep's deep waters, a door slam, a slurred voice, do your homework, fearing. Will I float? Chapter 36. The deal was, if Russell and Piper went to school for the rest of the week, Maniac would show them the shortcut to Mexico on Saturday. He figured if they all managed to survive till then, he'd come up with something. On Saturday, the boys had their paper bag packed, and Maniac knew, Maniac had a new deal. Go to school for another week, and he'd treat them to another large pizza. Besides, he said, crossing his fingers, this was volcano season down in Mexico. The whole place was a sheet of red hot lava. Better wait till it cools down. They bought it, and they brought the same deal the following week. But school was still agony for the boys. It had to be worth more than pizza, more than a pizza a week. But what? The brothers thought and thought about it, and soon began to realize that the answer was sleeping between them every night. Ever since the famous Maniac McGee had showed up at their house, Russell and Piper McNabb had become famous in their own right. Other kids were always crowding around them, pelting them with questions. What's he like? What's he say? What's he do? Did he really sit on Finster Wall's front steps? Is he really that fast? Kids started giving them knots, sneaker laces, yo-yo string, toys, and saying, ask Maniac to undo this, will ya? Really, little kids referred to him as Mr. Maniac. The McNabs ate it up in the streets, the playgrounds, 
school, the attention, not the pizza, was the real reason they put up with school each day. They began to feel something they had never felt before. They began to feel important. What a wonderful thing, this importance. Waiting for them the moment they woke up in the morning, pumping them up like basketballs, giving them bounce. And they hadn't even had to and they hadn't even had to steal it. They loved it. The more they had it, the more they wanted. And so when Maniac tried to cut the next pizza for school deal, Russell answered, No. No, echoed, echoed Maniac, who had been afraid it would come to this. No, said Russell, we want something else. Oh, said Maniac, what's that? They told him. If he wanted another week's worth of school out of them, he would have to enter Finsterwall's backyard and stay there for ten minutes, screeched Piper, who shuddered at the very thought. When Maniac casually answered, okay, it's a deal, Piper ran shrieking from the house. On the next Saturday morning, Russell Piper and Maniac set out for Finsterwall's house about seven blocks away. And they took the alleys along the way, and they were joined by other kids who were waiting, their eyes at once fearful and excited. By the time they got to Finsterwall's backyard, at least 15 kids huddled against the garage door on the far side of the alley. Maniac didn't hesitate. He walked straight up to the back gate, opened it, and went in. Not only that, he went all the way to the center of the yard, turned, folded his arms, smiled, and called, Who's keeping time? Russell, his throat too dry to speak, raised his hand. For 10 minutes, 15 kids and possibly the universe held their breath. The only sounds were from the inside of the inside their head were inside their heads, the moaning and wailing of the ghosts of all the poor slobs who had, who had ever blundered onto Finsterwald's property. To the utter amazement of all, when Russell finally croaked time, Maniac McGee was still there, alive, smiling, apparently unharmed. Even more amazing, he didn't come out. Instead, he said, say, you guys, how about adding to the deal? If I do something else while I'm in here, you will make it to school, to the, I'm sorry, will you make it the next two weeks at school. Well, what are you going to do, stammered Russell. Maniac thought for a minute, then announced brightly, I'll knock on the front door. Five kids fenced a wally on the spot. Several others screamed, no, don't. Piper went into some sort of fit and began kicking the garage door. Russell zoned out. Maniac took all of this to signify a deal. He hopped the backyard fence and strolled around the front. The others went back down the alley and around the long way. They stationed themselves not only across the street, but almost halfway up the block. And even then, they squeezed together in a bunch as though if, allowed, if they allowed any space between them, Finsterwall might somehow pick them off one by one. They huddled, trembling to bear witness to the last seconds of Maniac McGee's life. They saw him stand directly in front of the red brick three-story house, the bile green window shades. They saw him climb the three cement steps to the white door, the portal of death. They saw him raise his hand, and though they were too far away to hear, they saw him knock upon the door, and 15 hearts beat in time to the silent knocking. The door opened. Finster Wall's door open. Not much, but enough to witness but enough so the witnesses could make out a thin strip of blackness. Would Maniac be sucked into the black hole like so much lint into a vacuum cleaner? Would Finsterwall's long bony hand dart out quick quick as a lizard's tongue and snatch poor Maniac? Maniac appeared to be speaking to the dark crack. Was he pleading for his life? Would his last words be skewered like a marshmallow by Finsterwall's dagger tipped cane? Apparently not. The door closed. Maniac bounded down the steps and came jogging toward them, grinning. Three kids bolted. Sure, he was a ghost. The others stayed. They invented excuses to touch him to see if he was still himself, still warm. But they weren't positively certain until later when they watched him devour a pack of butterscotch crippets. Chapter 37. Thus began, began a series of heroic feats by Maniac McGee. At 20 paces, he hit a telephone pole with a stone 61 times in a row. When the once-a-week freight train hit Elm Street, he started running from the Oriole Street end one uh, on one rail and beat the train to the park, no sweat. He took off his sneaks and socks and walked nonchalant as you please through the rat-infested dump at the foot of Rako Hill. The mysterious hole down by the creek, the one you would never reach into, even if you dropped your most valu valuable possession into it. He stuck his hand in, his arm in, all the way to the elbow, kept it there for the longest 60 seconds on record, and pulled it out dirty, but still full of fingers. 
He climbed the fence at the American bison pen at the zoo. He had suggested this feat himself, everyone else scoffing, and while the mother looked on, kissed the baby buffalo. There's a special note here. Um, nobody knows why the buffalo became bull in the jump rope song. History often gets it wrong. That's from a previous chapter. Um, so it went through February and March of that year, a feat a week. Too much of the town, to much of the town, hearing about these things, it was simply a case of the legend adding to itself, doing what legends do. To Russell and Piper McNabb, it was a case of boosting their importance ever higher in the eyes of the other kids. It was not at the brothers' direction that Maniac performed these deeds. And who, after all, in this more amazing, and who, after all, is the more amazing, the lion or the tamer? As for Maniac, he understood early on that he was being used for the greater glory of Piper and Russell. He also understood that without him, they would not be going to school every day. For the McNabs, there was nothing free about public education. A tuition had to be paid. Every week, Maniac paid it. And besides, he loved to meet the challenges they cooked up for him. And then one day, he gave them the most perilous challenge of all. He dared, he, they dared him to go into the East End. <laughs>